Hi, everyone. Welcome to our August edition of Economic Insights. I am happy to have Marcy with us again this month. Marcy, thanks for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing great this morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm ready to talk some economy, starting, though, with um, some sad news. Um, the, the Queen has passed. Um, and this is maybe given, you know, the, the position of the royal family these days, more of a psychological blow uh, to the country. But at the same time, they've had so much turmoil, um, some more directly impactful than other. We've had, of course, a major shift with the, with the prime minister. Liz Truss is just taking uh, office. And um, England and beyond, we have serious talk about a, a pretty scary winter given fuel prices. So let's start there. Break this down for us. Sure. Well, I have to say, for those of you who know me, I don't wear black very often, but I did kind of feel like it was appropriate this morning um, to sort of mark the passing of, I guess, the longest reigning monarch that England had ever seen. And in some ways, her passing is, you know, a symbol of number one, the dark winter that Great Britain and larger Europe faced because of elevated uh, natural gas prices in particular. Um, inflation um, in Great Britain is running much higher than it's running in the US. So it is elevated there, it is over 9% and it hasn't come down. Unlike in the US where we've seen inflation peak in June of this past year and we've seen two consistent lower inflation numbers, which I think for all of us has been good news. Um, but if you look at Great Britain and beyond into uh, the European Central Bank, we had recent news just this past week that the European Central Bank took the unprecedented step of raising rates 75 basis points in an effort to combat the inflation that is still raging on that continent. If you look at Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, inflation is running 20% in those countries. And it all comes down to the fact that unlike the US, which has its own energy production industry, uh, particularly with natural gas being such a regional um, non-tradable good, um, in Europe, they came to depend um, heavily on Russian gas, which the Russians have now cut off almost completely to the continent and certainly to Germany. So they are facing uh, very high energy prices with no end in sight. Um, except, I will say this, there are some interesting developments that are likely to mitigate in the next few months the blow. Um, number one is some um, temporary liquid natural gas um, terminals, not permanent ones, but temporary ones that are being parked on the shores of the Netherlands that will allow them to import liquid natural gas from the rest of the world. So they will no longer be as dependent as they were on the pipelines coming from Russia, and they will have the ability now to quickly get some liquid natural gas delivered to them via ocean, right? So that's one thing. Um, the other thing that, that mitigates some of these problems um, is something that maybe many of you have heard me say many times over. I do not worry so much about the disasters that I can see coming. I don't worry about those so much because people have time to prepare and they can take steps when they sort of see something that's on the horizon, um, like a really cold winter with really high energy prices, People make decisions, um, millions of people will make individual decisions to protect themselves from that terrible eventuality. And so just the, 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 the analogy that I use is always Y2K, right? Remember Y2K and it was all gonna be terrible. The century date changed, the computers weren't ready. We all got generators in our basement. We got extra cash out of the ATM because it wasn't gonna work. And then we woke up on January 1st of 2000 and nothing happened. And the reason nothing happened is because we could all see it coming, right? So the disasters you can see coming are not generally the ones that cause significant economic disruption. They can be hard for people, and certainly it's going to be a burden for your average European citizen and certainly for your average British citizen. Um, and it's leading to political turmoil, obviously. You have a new prime minister, the last prime minister who would have met with the Queen just last week. Um, Liz Truss inherits a really problematic situation um, with Brexit, with high prices, you know, all these things that are going to make it very, very difficult for your average person over the next couple of months. 
But some of that will be mitigated by this economic principle that we all need to remember. The disasters we can see coming cause much less trouble than the ones that take us by surprise that we never, never saw coming. So let's turn to the U.S. right now, because we do see something coming, uh, which is another hike coming at the end of this month. We're anticipating probably 0.75, right? I mean, this is this is what this is. They have not denied this. Um, so what does that mean? We saw inflation peak in June, start to come down a little bit. What's the trajectory and what does that mean? Well, you have to remember that that again, the Federal Reserve is doing what we used to say they're they're talking the talk and they're walking the walk, right? So they're telling you what they're going to do. They don't want to surprise people, right? They want you to see it coming. That's why every time they get out and give a talk, they're talking about how we're now committed to inflation reduction. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep going because they're trying to influence your psychology. Right. Because the last thing you want people to do is have inflation expectations ingrained in their behavior, because if I, Marcy, sort of feel like prices are going to continue to go up no matter what. Right. That the price of gas is going to keep going up. The price of food is going to keep going up. That begins to influence my behavior. So I start to hoard goods. Maybe I buy things now when I really should put it off and buy it later. So inflation can have this insidious effect on people's decision making if it becomes entrenched. Those are the words that, that economists use. So they are trying very, very hard to sort of convince people that they are absolutely on top of this. Because like I said before, that psychology of looking forward and seeing something coming can influence the way that I behave today. And so they are very much in the mode of, we have to convince the public we're serious about this. It, we're gonna do it, man. We're gonna do it no matter what. Sort of like you know when you discipline your children, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I promise. Well, let me count to three, one, two, three, right? That's the mode that they're in, convincing us that they're serious. And we're seeing the effects of that. Again, inflation peaked in June. It has since come down, right? So it came down in the month of July. We will get a report next week on the August numbers and pretty much the consensus is that we'll get a lower inflation number. But there is something that I wanna bring everybody's attention to because there's been this debate around is inflation the result of just loose monetary policy? Is it demand driven or is it supply chain driven? And we have some sort of evidence now from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. They wrote a blog post um, about a week ago, and they basically said, if we look at the data, what we sort of see is that the COVID, the, the COVID surge in demand for goods that we've all talked about, we all know, everybody replaced their dishwasher, their refrigerator, they put new pools in, that demand surge that was rather unexpected resulted, sort of accounted for about 60% of the inflation that we've seen over the last two years. 40% of it was supply chain disruption. So basically what they said was that inflation would have only been 6% had it not been for the supply chain disruptions. So part of inflation coming down is an improvement in supply chains. And so I have a handy little graph because I always like to you know, bring a little graph so we can look at that right now because the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has a measure of supply chain pressure. And I am watching this very, very closely and I wanna share it with all of you because they went back and looked and said, you know, supply chains, there's always a little bit of pressure on supply chains. They went back 20 years. You can see this all, goes all the way back to 2002. And any time the line is below the zero, that means there's a lot of slack in the supply chain. It's easy to get goods and they're cheap. Anytime it goes above, that suggests that there's a disruption to the supply chain. Um, it can be caused by international trade issues. It can be caused by transportation issues, those sorts of things. Well, you can see that it basically bounces very, very innocuous for the last 20 years. But then we get to COVID, it spikes, it declines, and it appears as if it peaked in December of 2021. So it's still elevated by historical standards, but we are off the worst of the supply chain disruptions and it is trending in the proper direction, which suggests that that push to inflation is behind us. 
And we also know that the stimulus money that came um, with the American Rescue Plan in 2021, all of that money that was being dumped into people's bank accounts, um, that's over with. So all of that fiscal stimulus combined with the supply chain issues, both of those things are getting better. And that is the backdrop to the Federal Reserve tightening monetary policy pretty aggressively. So that's a recipe for inflation improving in the U.S. next month and the next month and the next month. So all the sort of suggestions are there that the inflation picture is improving and that the Federal Reserve is indeed successful um, in their campaign to convince us that they're going to do whatever it takes to get inflation under control. Let's dig down and, and talk a little bit about the interplay between what we just talked about and the housing market. And this audience is when the questions start rolling in from you guys. Let her rip. Put those questions in the Q&A box. We'll start addressing those as uh, as we come through um, and find moments in the conversation. But Marcy, the, the latest HUD report was it was a little grim. Um, there were words, uh, just glance at it. You've got slumped, plummeted, declined, volatile, insecurity. I just made notes. Like it's, it's not looking great. But is this really the picture? Well, I think we have lost a lot of perspective. Um, around the housing market because of what's happened over the last two years. I want to ask each and every one of you out there who are in this industry, has there been anything normal about housing markets since the pandemic began? Right. No inventory, skyrocketing prices, um, houses selling for asking price or above with cash offers with buyers who have never even seen the house right? Nothing normal about that, right? Nothing normal. So if I were to write the headlines around the housing market right now, which I understand why your average reporter puts plummeted, recession, slump in their headlines, because that's what grabs your attention, right? But what I would say is housing market beginning to return to normal. That's how I would phrase it. Because if you look at something like, say, existing home sales, right? The latest number on existing home sales um, the headline was existing home sales fall by highest amount since 2008. Well, you put housing in 2008 in the same line and everybody panics, right? But the reality is when you actually look at the numbers from that report, it is true that home sales last month, the last month we have them for, um, fell to an annual rate of 4.1 million a year. Well, prior to the pandemic, they were running between five and five and a half per year, right? So it's not actually that far off from pre-pandemic numbers. And that, but if you dig a little bit deeper, the average time that a home sits on the market is 14 days. That's not anywhere close to the six month average that we would all consider normal, right? That's normal, it's normal to take three to six months to sell a house, not 14 days. There's only three months worth of inventory on the market right now, not six months worth of inventory, three months worth of inventory. So housing markets in terms of, uh, I would argue, they are doing something more like returning to normal. They are in an adjustment process where anyone who wanted to, to sort of lock in a mortgage over the last year knew that the Federal Reserve was going to raise rates eventually. So you get this rush to lock the mortgage rate in by the house right now. So I would argue that we squeezed two years of housing market activity into a six month period of time. And so these activity numbers that are obviously a response to higher mortgage rates curtailing people from sort of entering the market right now, we're just in an adjustment process. It looks nothing like 2008 where people were heavily levered. They had mortgages that under no circumstances could they afford because they had no doc loans, liar loans. They were heavily indebted. And so when the value of the house declined, they were completely underwater and they handed the keys back to the bank. I read a story in Bloomberg, which is a, a site that I, I frequent quite often. And there was a commentator who said, 
given that the housing market boom was driven by lax lending standards and the ability of banks to securitize those loans and pass the risk off to someone else, given that that is completely ended and shut down, he said, I doubt there will be a housing bust like 2008 in our lifetimes. As long as banks keep lending standards high, right? And you don't have the indebtedness that you had before, you don't get a repeat of 2008 and 2009. But what you do get is a return to more normal circumstances. And the transition to that is going to feel really bad. And it's going to look bad in the headlines when it's just a return to normal. Let's talk demographics for a second. I was actually out in DC. There was a demographics expert talking and the focus was very much on the interplay between our boomers and our millennials. And especially with millennials looking forward, I mean, this again is not bad longer term news. Talk a little bit about the millennials and, and where they are with the housing market right now. Sure. Well, less than 50% of millennials own a home right now. Less than 50% of millennials own a home right now. If millennials do, like every other generation, and their home ownership rates hit 60%, and my friends, there's no reason to believe that they would. Millennials have done everything every other generation has done, with the exception, they just have been doing it later, right? So we said they're never gonna have families. Well, they are having families. They're just doing it in their 30s instead of in their 20s. They're never gonna own homes. Yeah, they are. They're just gonna do it in their 30s, not in their 20s. So they're delayed by roughly 10 years. So if 50% of millennials own homes right now, then you've got 10% of them that still haven't bought that first home. So that's millions and millions of potential buyers out there that still are going to get into the housing market eventually, right? So there's a ton of just natural pent up demand there. Um, and some of those, right, will might see their student loans forgiven, right? And that could be a further burst to sort of moving them along in the housing market timeline, so to speak. But just you always have those 50% of millennials that have bought their home in the next few years, they're going to move to the next house. They're going to move from their starter house up. And all of that sort of transaction activity, it, it is on the horizon. And while they have a lot of student loan debt, they don't have a lot of housing market debt. So they're not indebted from that perspective. Um, and, and, and so that is a tremendous a, a sort of just natural stimulus to housing markets in general that we're going to see play out, I would say over the next five years or so. We've got a question in from the audience asking about uh, the thoughts on the recent first time home buyer index by the National Association of Realtors. Have you looked at that? Um, I don't have it in front of me. So I'm not sure like what the question would be, but I can definitely, why don't we sort of put that on our list as something to go and look at um, and, and talk about on our next call because I don't have it in front of me. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing from from December 2021. This is more recent. Um, we will look into that, and it's from Shannon. We'll we'll get back to it. So let's let's as as the questions keep going, bring them keep bringing them in. Let's go back global for a minute because while the U.S. is normalizing, China is not normal right now. There are some incredible headlines right now. Marcy, you and I talked a little bit uh, late last year about Evergrande, which is a massive development country, huge amounts of debt, um, really entrenching themselves, and it's just gotten worse. So China is obviously a big player right now. What does that look like, not only within China, but are we going to see uh, reverberations across the globe? Well, I have argued for a really long time that China is likely to grow old before they grow rich. And they are in the midst of a corporate debt crisis. It's not an individual debt crisis like we saw in 2008, 2009. Um, the debtors are more concentrated. They're large corporations. But what they essentially involve is a struggle where the Chinese typically prepay for their homes. And then these builders build them. Right. So there's no thriving mortgage market like what you see in the U.S., which means the real risk is shifted not to banks. Right. It's not the banks that 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 take on the individual risk so much as individual home buyers 
who are essentially financing these giant firms. And so it's hard to sort of economically parse or draw some sort of analogy to anything that we've seen in the US. But in my mind, having your builder on such a large scale um, become so troubled that they can't fulfill their promise to build your house and you've paid for it already on that kind of scale, it's almost as if um, someone's house burns down and they have no insurance basically to cover the loss. These so are people who are, need a roof, right? They need a roof over their head, exactly. And it's an uninsured, and it's an uninsured loss, right? So what an uninsured loss means is basically you got a bunch of Chinese consumers who just got a lot poorer really quickly. So they were struggling anyway. So this is bad for Chinese consumption. It is going to be a real struggle for the Chinese economy overall when you have so many individuals with such a tremendous absolute loss, right? Um, that, that, that the government will either have to pick up the bill for, which they may or may not. Um, and so the whole thing means the Chinese economy um, is really, it's just one more struggle on top of high energy prices, which affect the Chinese economy much differently than they do in the US. We need to remember that when energy prices, particularly oil prices are elevated, it used to be that that was a net, net bad for the US. But now that we have a huge domestic production industry, right? We produce as much oil in this country as they do in Saudi Arabia, which means elevated industry, Elevated gas, excuse me, elevated oil prices are great for Oklahoma. They're great for North and South Dakota. They're great for Texas. Um, they're great for those states, right? So they're, for any state that produces oil, it's a net benefit. Now, for those of us who consume oil on net, it's a, it's, it's a problem. But overall, elevated oil prices are probably sort of net zero on their effect in the U.S., China, however, has heavy industry that consumes a lot of oil. And they are getting that oil cheaply from Russia right now. So they're sort of insulated a little bit from these elevated oil prices, sort of at $100 a barrel. It's still a drag on their economy. It's very different than when oil trades at $50 a barrel as opposed to $100 a barrel. So the Chinese economy is struggling. It will continue to struggle. Um, but... In terms of the global effect of all of that, um, I don't see their their recession as being all having a whole lot of spillover effects because their consumers don't buy a lot of high level goods from the rest of the world. They buy a lot of luxury goods, so you may get some struggling in the luxury sector, right? So you may get struggling in the luxury sector, but I don't see this recession as having a large effect on the main exports of the U.S. and the rest of the world to Europe, which is commodities like wheat, rice, um, soybeans. Um, that That's typically what they buy from the rest of the world. And, and those are necessities. So those are going to be a little bit less volatile than, say, luxury goods overall. You and I, a few, a few economic insights ago, talked about the shift in globalization that the pandemic specifically had. This seems to be exacerbating. This is this is more news on a really, maybe not dire, but a, a different a different approach to globalization going forward. Any comments there? Well, absolutely. You know, I, you and I sort of have talked about it and I was thinking about when yesterday um, we, we all got the news that sort of the British monarch had passed away, the longest reigning. This is someone who took the throne 75 years ago. And I thought she watched the world change so dramatically. While the global power of Great Britain was on the demise, the globalization of trade, of travel, of politics was really sort of, she watched the shift from the old colonialism to sort of the more new democratic norm. She watched the rise of the US as a global power, the rise of Russia as a global power, and the rise of China as a global power. And suddenly it's almost as if her death um, mirrors what we see happening around the world with a shift to a new equilibrium and something different than the globalization 
that we all, I think myself included, sort of took for granted in the 90s and the early 2000s. We are watching the world split off economically into two blocks. There will be the Russia and everything to the east of that, with the exception of sort of Australia and New Zealand, and then Ukraine and everything to the west of that. And with that comes a reshoring of economic activity. We are seeing subsidies, big, large subsidies from the US government to support a domestic semiconductor industry in order to prevent disruptions, not from another pandemic, but from the potential for um, Chinese disruption to Taiwan's production. So my concern, quite frankly, is that as China weakens economically, they will become more belligerent politically in order to compensate for that. I believe that that's what's happening if you look at Russia. As they have weakened economically, they become more belligerent to their neighbors in an effort to sort of gloss over that and promote nationalism. The wounded I, animal effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so my concern is that this is what could happen with China. And what it means is you get a tremendous amount of reshoring of manufacturing activity into the US um, and away from Asia. And that further weakens China. And one more thing, China's made tremendous investments in their uh, Belt and Road Initiative, right? And those loans, all that investment that they made um, over the course of the years, um, some of that is starting to go south, right? And that's gonna be costly to them as well. So there are all sorts of you know, things on, on the horizon for China and none of them look particularly good in my mind. But when I shift my mind over to sort of what's happening in the US, um, when I look at currency markets, which is something that I, I look at very, very closely, currency markets are signaling that the U.S. economy on the global stage stands to perform better than anywhere else on the planet. The U.S. dollar has appreciated against every single currency on the globe, with the exception of the Russian ruble. And the only reason the Russian ruble is appreciating is because they have strict capital controls in place to hold the currency into the country to keep from massive capital outflows occurring. So it's being artificially sort of manipulated. You can't really look at that one. But if you look at the US dollar, right now it's at parity with the Euro. So for those of you who are contemplating a trip to Europe, man, get your currency now. It is strong relative to the yen and the Chinese who for most of my lifetime were trying to depress their currency to promote exports are now doing the flip side and having to spend dollars to keep their currency elevated because it's weakening so rapidly. All of that suggests that policy in the US is getting inflation under control quicker than a year ago. Because remember that inflation erodes the value of your currency so if the world is saying the US dollar is actually more valuable than everything else, that's a signal that inflation in the US is less of a problem than everywhere else around the globe. And I believe that's the main message that I'm taking from financial markets right now, from currency markets, from the bond market, that if you look around the globe, the US is actually in a much better position than everybody else. Got a couple more questions rolling in here. Um, the first, not from a political standpoint, but how do you anticipate the midterms to affect the election or to affect the economy? Excuse the me. economy? Um, well, there's a couple of outcomes that are possible. So not from a political point of view, but the most likely outcome seems to be that um, from, from it, and I'll just, The Economist magazine wrote a recent article about this. So I'm just imagining you all read this Economist article with me. Right. So the Economist magazine wrote an article very recently and said, with our statistical models, and by the way, I don't run any election models, so I just have to look at what other people do. Right. So they run statistical models. They look at every single race and they say it looks as if you're going to have divided. Congress will be divided in the next um, in the next sort of two years. Right. So the Senate probably will be in the hands of Democrats by one seat, right? So that's not much. And 
Democrats will lose control of the House by several seats. Those are the election models right now, just today. Um, but Joe Biden's still going to be at the White House, right? So it wouldn't matter if the Senate and the House went Republican. You still got Joe Biden in the White House. So you're going to have divided government is the most likely scenario. So you're not going to see an, another American Rescue Plan. You're not going to see an Inflation Reduction Act of 2023 right? So all the policy that could happen um, that would have economic implications um, is probably done for the most part. And that the midterms will mean that there won't be any significant um, tax changes, fiscal policy changes um, in the next two years. That's the most likely outcome today, right now. Um, anything could happen in the next couple of weeks to change that. Um, but but we're very close to the midterms right now. Great. Uh, going back to China, we've got a question. When you said that the Chinese prepay for their homes and they then they build, what about pre-existing uh, properties? How is that handled? Um, well, you know, if they if they and I I don't I am not intimately sort of involved with the Chinese economy, but I think my understanding is that really what they have is more like a 99 year lease on their houses. Right. I think that that's correct. So their home ownership and the ability to trade their homes is much more restricted than it is in the U.S. Right. But I don't know exactly the details of that. But certainly, as you see stress in one part of the housing market, people's perceptions of the economy overall and its strength or its weaknesses will affect their behavior. So even if they're even if your mortgage is not in danger. Right. Even if your house is paid for, when you see the value of other homes go up or down, that has an effect on you. It's psychological. So even if I have no intention of selling my house, if I know my neighbor's houses are going, the price of them is going up, I feel richer. And when I feel richer, what do I go out and do? I spend more money. I just do. But if I feel poorer, because even if the crisis doesn't affect me, I can see that it affects my neighbors. If that makes me feel poorer, then I feel like the world is riskier. I'm going to curtail my spending. I'm going to increase my savings. And that's the likely effect on people in China, even if they're not directly affected themselves by what's going on with these home builders. We've reached the bottom of the hour and actually gone into post game here. Um, oh. Folks, I know, but guess what? We get to do it again next month. So, yes, we do. you know, we do. Uh, everyone who attended in person, thank you. Uh, uh, recorded viewers, thank you. Uh, please rejoin us next month. And for this month, um, probably Monday, maybe early Tuesday morning, everybody will be, uh, uh, there will be a link available with a recap of all of this that is co-brandable and available to share with clients and friends and colleagues. So Marcy, appreciate you so much for being here. Everybody be well. See you next time. Bye.